After doing quite a bit of pondering, I've noticed that a lot of you guys love a good old-fashioned tier list, even more than Miyazaki enjoys the subtle screams of children unlucky enough to discover a FromSoft game. With that being said, here is another one. Important disclaimer before we begin. This is purely for fun, and some opinions may differ, so please list your ideal order of easiest to hardest bosses below if you have the time. Also, don't forget to turn on the notification bell below the video player because subscribing just isn't enough anymore. I may need to start vlogging, and that's just not gonna happen, so if that bell isn't slapped hard, then I don't know. Alright, now that we're all informed, let's get into it. Number 1. A large demon found during the tutorial in the Northern Undead Asylum. This boss is similar to the vanguard of Demon Souls in both attack style and moveset in the story. After escaping from your cell and lighting the first bonfire, you are met with this absolute unit. If Thick was a stat, Asylum Demon would be Instagram famous, but instead, he dreamed of taking flight, which he does briefly before falling back to Earth because gravity disagreed with those tiny little shit wings. In all seriousness, this is the easiest boss, because sticking to his tail side and poking away is all that you need. Rarely can he back punish the player character, so this boss simply is just lacking the tools to keep you off the behind. Number 2. I had to make sure it was known that Pinwheel can and is harder than Asylum Demon on lower damage runs. Especially if you get stuck in the Catacombs early game. Remember that? This necromancy experiment, secretly combining a family of three into a conjoined anomaly, was just trying to figure out how to go back to normal, and your chosen undead ass rolls up and destroys them. He can technically die before even multiplying, but once the clones are loose, you better hope you have eyes on the back of your head to dodge those fireballs. Number 3. Supposed brother of the Sisters of Izalith, and potentially responsible for the lava flow throughout the Demon Ruins. Ceaseless Discharge is next up on the plate, but first, I need a definition of what the hell is a Ceaseless Discharge. Doesn't sound too good. This monster is incredibly tricky to deal with first time around, but there's a super simple easter egg type of kill where you can get him to jump off a cliff and hang on to the ledge close to the fog gate. After a handful of attacks to his hand, this dude loses health quicker than his body can fall into that pool of tomato soup below. Number 4. Porus Demon was a difficult choice for 4th place because I do think he is a solid early game boss to teach you the ropes of the game. This minotaur demon found on the castle wall above Undeadburg likes to knock you off the map, jump on you, and sometimes just run at you like a giant building. Romantic, right? Fortunately, you can just climb a ladder beside the fog gate and plunge attack for an easy kill, but I'd like to think that some people wouldn't know how to do that first time around. Therefore, I give Taurus Demon fourth place. Number 5. Moonlight Butterfly, the less powerful, less cool, and ultimately shittier version of Mothra. While visually cool, it's just a waiting simulator, unless you have a bow or magic. You simply can wait out its projectiles, and then when it gets hungry and wants to munch on that bridge moss, you strike. Sometimes it's easy to get overwhelmed and caught in the series of failed heals amidst the bombardment of magic missiles and needles. Because of this, you have a decent chance of getting destroyed as a new player, but all the reason to not as an experienced one. Number 6. Gaping Dragon is... Oh my god, what the fuck is that thing? Basically a rat trap lizard with belly teeth. While I try to figure out the origins of this creature's DNA, I might as well list some reasons why it's more of a challenge than the rest of the list thus far. You have tramples, you have the slams, you have a gigantic jump attack that does not support the anatomy of this absolute alien. Just when you thought you were safe, this thing will pee its non-existent pants and flood the arena with liquid that's definitely not sanitary. Albeit a myriad of tricks and flashy things for the first timer, I've still lost runs to this boss somehow just from simply miscalculating my spacing. The cherry on top is that Iron Pineapple decided to take a day off making YouTube content to stand outside the arena and buff this thing with his cheeky Chandler dance and staff of cheat codes. Fun times. Number 7. The final trial of Sense Fortress will test your game sense, your intuition, and most importantly, your life insurance policy. Cause let's face it, this dude walks so slow that none of us will be around by the time he reaches the other side of the arena. But in the case that you are brave enough to dive into the plethora of stomp combos, projectiles, swipes, and slams, plus a grab attack that can literally throw you off the map. You may stop laughing once that happens. Most importantly, this boss has a unique stagger mechanic that's similar to Tower Knight in Demon Souls, where you can knock Iron Golem over onto his butt. Doing this strategically with his back facing to a ledge means exactly what we thought would happen with every other boss near a cliff in a video game, except this time, there's no cheesy invisible wall stopping us. Because of this, I have to list him as spot number seven. Number eight. The last born of Lord Gwyn. Gwendolyn is the leader of the Blade of Dark Moon Covenant and the only remaining deity in Anor Orlando. My elders always taught me to not trust snakes, and this detached Aldrich torso has snakes for legs. That's sus. 
Furthermore, the fight consists of super flashy yet simple to evade magic and bow projectiles that can simply be strafed or shielded by the pillars on the outside wall of the corridor. There is one particular projectile that has to be dodged a little bit more carefully, but come on, they have to give them an attack that can actually hit the player, right? I think on a first time through the game, this boss gave me some serious trouble as I was underleveled and didn't understand that it's secretly a meme. Number 9. Stray Demon. The cousin of Asylum Demon decided to actually be a decent enemy and learn some magic attacks, including an explosion so large you might as well give up. Just kidding. You can still stick to his tail and succeed, just note that he will try to pressure you into corners and place that big AoE attack in places that require pre-planning to escape. In addition, he exchanges Asylum Demon's big boy hammer for a staff. That's kind of cute. Number 10. I'm sure you could see this coming. Demon Fire Sage is next. The third and final version of the Asylum Demon architecture you will experience. New, improved, and more annoying than ever, this boss actually backsteps quite often to create setups to trap you in that amazing AoE attack. Because of this attack and Roots creating semi-barricades in the room, this boss feels like it's smarter than you sometimes. First playthrough, I was personally decimated and I'm not ashamed to admit it. Just don't tell anybody, I'm trying to grow the channel. But nowadays, things are much more smooth. Once in a while, it's capable of giving me quite a scare on serious runs. Number 11. Half Dragon and Half Barefoot Amazonian. Crossbreed Priscilla will most likely be too popular to respond to your DMs about feet picks. After asking you to leave the painted world of Ariamis peacefully, I'm sure a decent amount of the player base did the exact opposite. For these sins, you are met with an invisible foe that will bleed you dry with the Life Hunt Scythe. Since you have footsteps to work with, it makes it fair enough to predict her position, but it can still be quite sketchy. If you're able to stagger her back into the visible realm, you may be rewarded with a fairy dust Disney princess looking attack, and that shit is wholesome. Number 12. Of course it wouldn't be a tier list if I didn't include spider melons back to back with dragon lady feet. I got you guys. Chaos Witch Quayleg, transformed by the flames of chaos, becoming half spider demon and half human resides at the bottom of Blight Town. Along with this transformation comes lava. Lots of lava. I mean, I'm pretty sure there's volcanoes that are jealous of this lady's molten spew. The spew part can vary. Small pools of lava, big pools, and even some where the spider face will be forward, but she'll shoot it sideways. There's also an awesome jump with the lava that pressures the player to make one of two decisions. You can go under, or you can run the hell away and hope she doesn't keep jumping towards you. There's a big area of effect attack similar to an explosion where it can be triggered from hitting the spider butt. I know it's tempting, but just don't do it. She also wields the Chaos Fury Sword, one of the coolest looking weapons in the game, especially when it shaves off your eyebrows from your face without consent. All these reasons backed by a decently large health pool is enough to make Quayleg number 12. Number 13. Located on the roof of Undead Parish, guarding the path to the glorious Vale of Awakening, not one, but two halberd-wielding statues come to life and decide to pick a bone with you on a sunny afternoon. Let's hope that you pick a homeward bone with them. Well, I guess if you really want to kill them, you can. Just make sure to utilize the roof space to have your way with the first gargoyle before the second one comes out of nowhere and flame broils you like a succulent sirloin steak. Number 14. Before someone calls PETA on me, let me just point out that this dog has a sword and is the size of a large school bus. Residing in Dark Root Garden, Sif was Artorius the Abyss Walker's partner. When Artorius was consumed by the Abyss, he used his great shield to protect Sif, as he could no longer bear it with his broken arm. Now Sif guards the fallen comrade's grave and his ring. The fight is fairly dynamic. Sif has fast movement with huge leaps, sometimes landing on your head. The moveset revolves around a decent variety of slashes, a 360 spin, and even flailing when near death. The pace of the fight and sheer size of the weapon, not to mention how it can be hard to sometimes hit the thing, makes Sif a decent challenge on a first playthrough, and literally has ended challenge runs of my own recently. Number 15. The Lord of Death that waged war against the dragons. Nido rules over the dead in the catacombs and resides within the Tomb of Giants. Make sure to bring a flashlight and some snacks, because these dudes seriously need some vitamin D and meat on their bones. Nido can be made extremely straightforward and fought exclusively one-on-one -on -one if you know a little bit about rings in Dark Souls. Using the Slumbering Dragon Crest Ring in combination with the Ring of Fog, you can avoid triggering any of the skeletons in the fight and eliminate all aspects of luck. Without doing this, you will be hit from different directions and have a much harder time managing the respawning skeletons and Nido at the same time. Lastly, there is a way to despawn the skeletons by using a weapon that has a divine modifier, like the Crescent Axe from Patches. Hey, that Crescent Axe is, uh, it's pretty good, you know, just kill Patches. No big deal. I'm not gonna tell anybody. Number 16. Now for another all-time favorite. Well, not exactly. Capra Demon can be found in Lower Undead Burg. After dealing with quite an army of the most annoying enemies in Lower Undead Burg, you then get rewarded with this gem. 
Capra Demon itself is really not the problem. It's actually the fact that they put him in a shoebox. Add in a couple dogs and you are ready to party. Considering the first encounter you are more likely to be gangbanged before even really touching the boss, let's just say it gets ugly if you want an easy win as an experienced player. Making that cheese seem oh so delicious. For that method you have two options. Ring of Fog and Slumbering Dragoncrest Ring, like you used on Nido, or you can throw firebombs with the fog gate from outside and hope they land on him. Be careful though, sometimes the dogs are still alive even after he's dead. Woof. Number 17. Envy and Bitterness. Words used to describe Seath's betrayal of his own kind, for unlike his brethren, Seath was born without the stone scales of everlasting dragons. With the help of Gravelord Nido, Witch of Isleth, and Gwyn the Lord of Cinder, Seath brought his own race to the brink of extinction, presumably leaving him the last dragon alive. This mountain of moon spaghetti and fairy dust is actually quite scary. The good old poke the boss in the butt strat just doesn't work on this fight. Seath typically will pulverize you in one swift blow from his tentacles? I see someone at FromSoft likes their anime. Anyways, because he also sends a field of cursed crystal magic your way, making it harder to approach for hits without the right timing, this boss is harder on first playthroughs than most in the game. Especially if no one told you that you need to break the magic crystal stick at the back of the room, otherwise he's straight up invincible. Number 18. A large bug-like creature, defending the path of Lost Isolith. Its arms and tail are separate living centipedes, like they just detach and screw your day up real good. Did I mention when you fight this boss, the camera is absolute horseshit. Imagine Nameless King Phase 1 from DS3, but more moving parts and just really ugly. Good luck. I absolutely despise this thing. If you're feeling brave, killing one of the detached centipedes gives you the orange charred ring early. This allows you to take far less damage while traversing the lava pools surrounding the boss arena. Now you can stop having a panic attack every time the thing approaches and pull some Mr. Fantastic stretchy arm BS. The absolute jank and camera issues give this boss a high spot on my list. Number 19. Five individual seemingly identical wraiths who appear one at a time out of the darkness of the abyss. This boss is a politically incorrect statement. Four kings is not four kings. I want a goddamn refund, man. Someone call the cops. Okay, four kings can be killed so quickly that you don't even need to fight four or five for that matter, but if you have lower damage output on your character, this may be a nightmare. When multiple kings are spawned, they take turns poking at you from a distance, and there usually is always one king pursuing you, then occasionally switching out for another. The real problem arises when you have to fight them simultaneously, especially from angles you can't view at the same time. In challenge runs, this is considered a time-sensitive fight, meaning be fast, like Sanic. If you're on your first playthrough, using full havels or stone armor, then chugging Estus through the pain and suffering, you may just win immediately. But you're a punk for doing that. I did that, by the way. Number 20. In a futile attempt to prolong the Age of Fire, the Witch of Isleth tried to recreate the first flame. The ritual was a failure, and its power formed a bed of chaos, which would become the source of all demons trapping two of her daughters in the orbs on either side, including herself. That sounds cool and all, but long story short, this boss is unfinished and again, I want a refund. I think that it looks really cool. I give it that, but come on. It's kind of boring and it's a little cheap if you don't do the speedrun strats. If you want the easy win on this boss, all you have to do is go to the center of the arena and line up the crosshairs of your bow in the right spots. Throw some firebombs and GG easy, you won. After that, walk right into the center and smack that bug with absolutely anything because it really has no health. Well, maybe 1 HP. If you don't use this method, good luck enjoying many rounds of being slammed, exploded by fire pillars, and swept into the depths of who knows where. Maybe that's where they kept all the players that tried to tell others the truth of the game. Number 21. The White-Winged Lion, watchkeeper that dreaded the abyss. Sanctuary Guardian exhibited traits of several animals other than lions, suggesting it was closer to a demon in nature. Demon nature is what your parents and or neighbors will be hearing when they hear the shrieks and murmurs of insanity upon being unprepared for this fight. This manticore of a creature can rush you down fairly quick and has melee, projectiles that have their own AoEs, and it also flies. Wow, they just had to make it fly, huh? Luckily, its HP pool is not exactly the highest, and you should be able to make quick work of it if you spend time learning its moveset enough and have a high damage weapon. I know some people get a bit lucky and beat this boss without really suffering due to being overleveled for the DLC, but sometimes it can be tricky. Number 22. Once a human, Manus became the father of the Abyss when his humanity went wild. There isn't a known cause of this. According to Marvelous Chester and Hawkeye, an unidentified primordial serpent urged the citizens of Ulysseo to seek the Dark of the Abyss, awakening this primordial man. Upon awakening, he became enraged and set to expand his domain while seeking out his precious broken pendant. 
The pendant item found in the DLC allows you to make easier work of negating the dark magic that Manus casts, but even without his pew pews, this guy means business. His questionably overdeveloped arm can stretch like a slinky and just slaps the shit out of your sorry ass. He uses jumps, rushdowns, slams, and combos to put pressure in between the magic attacks and eventually increases the complexity of it. This boss is known to be one of the hardest, if not number one on some lists, but I can't wholeheartedly say it's that bad with enough practice. Number 23. Now for my favorite boss of Dark Souls. Our number one homeboy, Artorius, was one of the four Knights of Gwyn, alongside Ornstein, Kirin, and Hawkeye. He harnessed an unbendable will of steel, which both helped and fed his hatred for the Servants of Dark, particularly the Dark Wraiths of Kaith. Now there's plenty of juicy lore in this guy, but I want to bring the attention back to the mechanics of the fight. Imagine getting your ass kicked by a dude that's blind and can only use one arm, even though you're stacked to the teeth with the best gear in the game. That's the vibe. Artorius is so good at laying down a beating that I would not want to fight him in his prime. A combination of sliding lunges, swipes, spins, pirouettes, and flying through the air like an eagle, this man could possibly win the national gymnastics meet. When he charges up his buff successfully without interruption, he will flip, and flip, and flip, and flip again, until you're a pancake that smells and looks like beef jerky. Enough said. Number 24. One of the coolest looking dragons in a Souls game thus far, and with the finesse to back it up, Calamite is truly the pinnacle of DLC in terms of challenge. He breathes fire. He breathes fire when flying. He breathes fire while standing on his hind legs. Damn, I bet he even breathes fire while he's on the toilet too. Maybe both ways depending on how spicy the noobs were that he ate for lunch. You'll be lunged at from obscene distances. You'll be trapped in ear-piercing attacks that not only make you deaf, but will also put the Calamity Curse on your character, allowing them to take double damage. And he also has a super rare backflip attack, but I've never personally seen it, only on the internet. Calamite is a challenge even with a decent amount of experience. Number 25. Captain of the Four Knights of Gwyn and the executioner for the royal family of Anor Londo, Ornstein and Smo will leave you wondering if you will be returning your Dark Souls copy to GameStop the next morning. This is a super popular choice for the top hardest bosses in Dark Souls, let alone video games in general. Reason being that they have a very complementary playstyle to each other. Ornstein will rush you down with glitchy dashes and shoot projectiles while Smo will plow you into the stratosphere with his big hammer, all while laying down some big damage. It's super easy to get tripped up in a rhythm of knockdowns and devastating blows, making it harder to know when to heal than ever. To put the cherry on top, if killing these bastards wasn't hard enough, they decided to add a phase where a bigger version of whatever boss you left alive is there from phase one. Best strategy here is just to focus on one of them. I find it easier to kill Ornstein first, as Super Smo can get stuck on pillars and it's easier to win. But a lot of people have found ways to glitch out Big Ornstein and have found routes that are equally as viable. Nonetheless, this boss is majority of what FromSoft Games and Dark Souls stands for. The cardinal recipe of fairness without forgiveness. And a little bit of salt. Number 26. Now for what you've all been waiting for. I may get roasted for the rest of time for picking Gwyn as the hardest boss, but it won't be as bad as him slapping you with his fire stick for an eternity because you can't parry. Gwyn the Lord of Cinder seems to be far ahead of his time when it comes to basic Dark Souls mechanics. At least in my eyes, some of his attacks, like the super fast swing and some of the glitchy jumps, are hard to navigate just by dodging. He boasts a decent amount of health and is weak to fire? Well, it's kind of a lore thing, but yeah, Dark Souls made the Lord of Cinder weak to its own supply. Since he used to be the Lord of Sunlight, I'm gonna let that one slide. If you do learn to parry, the fight can be quick work, but proceed with caution. There's only one known method that's guaranteed safe, commonly used on zero damage runs, and I literally figured it out seven years after the game came out. GG from Soft. Well, that about wraps up this Dark Souls tier list video. Please leave a comment of what you agree or disagree with, and again, if you have the time, list your ideal ordering from easiest to hardest below. I love to read your comments and see people interacting with each other in the community, so don't be shy. As always, leave a like, subscribe, and if you enjoyed this video, make sure to hit the notification bell to never miss out on future videos. Take care, everybody.